All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for, for joining us on this uh, lovely Friday night. Um, you're tuned into the um, Boise State Physics First Friday Astronomy. My name is Brian Jackson. I'm a professor in the physics department at Boise State. Uh, and I'm very happy that you could join us this evening. Uh, for those of you who've never attended before, First Friday Astronomy uh, is an event that we host every month on the first Friday of the month. Um, and we bring in uh, a space scientist or someone who does uh, some work involved with space science. Um, so very frequently have astronomers come in and talk about their research, but not infrequently have folks like our guest tonight uh, who do things uh, related to space science. So we've had folks come in to talk about uh, space policy, people who work for the government um, on space topics. Uh, we've had uh, folks who uh, do all kinds of things besides just uh, astronomy. So. Um, if you're interested in uh, hearing more about space science and the things all around it, this is the right place to be. Um, next month, we are very, very fortunate to have uh, Professor Lindy Elkins Tanton from Arizona State University uh, She is the principal investigator for the Psyche mission which is going to visit uh, the asteroid Psyche, uh, which is a metallic world. Uh, it's going to be a really fascinating talk. We are really, really fortunate to, to, to have her uh, join us. Um, she told me when I invited her and she agreed to, to, to talk that we had just managed to squeeze into her schedule because it was a Friday night and she didn't have anything scheduled that night. So, um, so that'll be on March 5th. That's the Friday, the first Friday of March. Um, it'll be, again, 7.30, live streamed over YouTube. Um, so yeah, please join us for that. Uh, in addition to these first Friday, presentations, we've begun a uh, virtual planetarium show uh, once a month. Those are going to be on the third Thursday, All right? So we got our we got our talks on first Friday, and then we have our virtual planetarium shows on third Thursday. And those virtual planetarium shows are maybe a little less formal than our usual fr first Friday. They're not lecture. Um, we just kind of walk you through uh, the art of stargazing, talk a little bit about some space science things going on. Um, and so the next one of those events is going to be on uh, February 18th. That's the third Thursday of February. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the Mars 2020 mission, which will be landing that day uh, uh, on February 18th. So that'll be really exciting. Um, if you have registered for that uh, previously, you don't need to register again. But if, if you would like to register, um, I'm going to post the link to the, to the registration page on my website. But it's boi.st slash third Thursday, all one word. Um, and we ask that you register for that because those are in part, those are over zoom and, um, we have everywhere in the zoom room. So we want to make sure we know who's, who's, uh, involved with that. So again, I'll send, I'll post the link, um, to that on my website and, uh, please join us for that. I am trying to get our chat, uh, working. Unfortunately, for some reason, the YouTube chat feature does not seem to be working tonight. I don't know what the problem is um usually we ask our guests if they have questions for our speaker to to post their questions to chat hopefully <laughs> the chat works for the rest of you um because it's not working for me um however if you do have a question this evening maybe what we'll do is um why don't you send me an email so my email address is just bjackson at boisestate.edu and you can just google my name if you can't figure that one out bjackson at boisestate.edu or google my name You'll find my email address. And so send us questions maybe that way. Maybe that's the way we can do questions tonight. Since, yeah, I don't know why the YouTube chat feature is not working. Um, sorry about that. Uh, but we will have a really fascinating talk tonight. We're very fortunate uh, to have joining us this evening, uh, Lisa Grossman of Science News. And I'm going to let her give you her background like I um, usually do. And I'm going to turn it over to her. So um, go ahead, Lisa. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Lisa Grossman, and I'm going to share my screen now. I'm going to do. OK. Cool. OK, so I'm, as Brian said, I'm the science news astronomy reporter. Um, and I'm going to talk tonight about some of the similarities and differences between how scientists see science news and how science journalists see science news. I learned this stuff bit by bit as I transformed from an astronomy student into somebody who writes about space for a living. 
Um, so I'm going to try to collect everything that I've learned and put it on one place for you. Um, this talk is aimed mostly at people who do science or students of science, but hopefully there's something here for everyone who has ever read a science story in the news and wondered where that comes from. I have um, a one-year-old daughter named Miriam. This is her reading about red giants and pulsars. And so I've been thinking a lot lately about toddler communication, as well as my usual job of thinking about science communication. So I decided to call the talk, name the talk after this famous book, um, How to Talk, so science journalists will listen. Um, so a bit about me, I decided I wanted to study space when I was eight years old and I had a really cool third grade teacher who we did a unit on planets and then we did a unit on single celled organisms like this amoeba. And we looked at little creatures like this under a microscope and uh, my teacher said, do you think that these little creatures, we talked about all the crazy places on earth that they can survive like um, in the atmosphere and volcanoes and places where it's really salty and really cold and really hot. Um, and my teacher asked if we thought that these single-celled organisms could live in the environments on any of the planets that we had been talking about in the previous unit. And little eight-year-old me was like, I bet they could, that's amazing. And like, that was it for me for the rest of my life, pretty much. Um, I decided then and there, I wanted to be an astronomer and I wanted to find aliens. Uh, I also read some science communication that impacted me a lot. I watched the Cosmos series with Carl Sagan. I read, this is the 1997 edition of Contact that I still have. It's all torn up. Um, and so that, that was all really important to me. And that set me on the path that I have taken from there. So um, to study astronomy, I went to Cornell University for college. And I was lucky enough to get there a few months after the Mars rover Spirit and Opportunity landed in 2004. Um, the principal investigator of that mission was at Cornell and I got a job in the lab where they were processing the images. They, the images from the rovers came to Cornell first and then they had a little team of undergraduates and some grad students, most of us were undergrads, who would calibrate the images by um, kind of clicking around. They had this little, looks sort of like a joystick that had colors on it um, so we could tell the so, you know, they came down in black and white like this, but they actually had a lot of different spectra in there, different colors um, that they could take pictures in. And this was all, uh, you know, there's gonna be another Mars rover landing in a couple of weeks. That, that rover takes color pictures already. You don't have to do any of this stuff anymore, but this is what we had to do at the time. So that was my undergrad research job and I was so excited. And, uh, and then a little while after I started doing it, um, maybe a couple months in, I was like, I'm sure I'm looking at a lot of pictures of dirt. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was supposed to be a dream job and I was bored. Um, and that's also fine. Like research is tedious. It's, it's not supposed to be completely thrilling all the time. Um, but I started questioning whether I was actually cut out for this. Maybe research was not what I should be doing with my life if I couldn't even uh, <laughs> handle some months of Martian dirt. Um, so I started thinking about what else I might do. And my dad reminded me that we used to get all these science magazines. We got these astronomy magazines when I was a kid. Somebody writes for those magazines. Maybe I could do that. So I started writing for the Cornell Daily Sun, uh, which is uh, the independent daily newspaper that um, covers everything that happens at Cornell and some things that happen in ISCA. And it was great. If there are any students out there, uh, grad students or undergrads who are thinking maybe you might be interested in science writing and you wanna try your hand at it, write for your college newspaper. It's such great training. And uh, you can, you know, there's research happening at your institution. You get to write about it. You can go talk to your professors. Um, and that was really helpful for me also, cause I was really shy basically until I went to journalism school. Um, if you had told me in college, I was giving a talk like this now, I would be very surprised. And um, it really helped me learn, unlearn some of my shyness to be able to just go up to my professors or people I didn't know at all and say, hi, I'm interested in your research. I'm going to write about it. And they'll tell you, <laughs> it's really great. Um, I, am, I, I realized I loved it. This was really fun. Um, this is what I wanted to do. Well, I thought you would think that maybe I decided then that this is what I wanted to do, but I wasn't totally ready to give up on the dream of being a real live astronomer. So I applied to grad school, uh, to PhD programs in astronomy. Um, 
and I didn't get into any of them. And I realized I was relieved not to get in. And I was like, okay, well, that's data. If, I, if I'm relieved, maybe, maybe I really didn't want to do that. Maybe this is actually not what I should be doing. Um, the last school I was waiting to hear from was UC Santa Cruz. And they have a science communication program also. Um, this, is, this is Santa Cruz. This is from the banner of their website. And, but this is actually my class. I took this photo. And UC Santa Cruz, uh, their science communication program advertises itself as for people who like talking about their research more than they like actually doing it. And I, when I saw that, I was like, oh yeah, that's me. That, that's actually, actually exactly me. Um, maybe that's where I belong. So I called up their admissions office and I was like, I haven't heard from you yet about the astronomy program. That's bad, right? And they were like, yeah, probably. And um, so I asked them to transfer my application to the science communication program instead. And I was very lucky and I got in. Um, so I went and I did that. And the, one of the great things about this program in particular, there are a couple of different programs around the country and around the world that do similar things but Santa Cruz is the only one that requires the students to have a science background when they come in. So it's for recovering journalists, or sorry, recovering scientists to turn us into journalists. Um, and you also take uh, half of your time in classes and half your time at an internship at some publication around the Bay Area. So I got some real hands-on experience immediately. I wrote for a daily newspaper for the Santa Cruz Sentinel. I wrote for the press office at the Slack Linear Accelerator Lab. And I wrote for Wired um, as, a student still. Um, and I came out of the program with some published stories that I could show editors that like, look, I know what I'm doing. Um, and it was really great to have the actual real world experience, but also have the safety net of class to fall back on. And we could talk about the struggles we were having and, um, and have that support system. So this is certainly not the only way to break into science writing. Um, but for me, I can tell this joke with this audience. I can't do it always, but um, I found it was like, taking a, a gravity assist past Jupiter to end up in the outer solar system. But going to Santa Cruz altered my trajectory the way that Jupiter altered Voyager 1's trajectory as it was heading past all the giant planets and out of the solar system. Um, and this was also where I started to realize that there are some differences between how scientists approach their own work and how science journalists approach work um, or even science all science communicators, science writers in general, approach that same work um, when they're writing about it. So a few weeks into the first quarter, we were doing a news writing class and we had a mock press conference with a graduate student who was studying the Milky Way. And I was very excited to finally write about space. We had only written about things that were not space up until then. And I was like, this is probably good exercise, but like, give me some astronomy. So I was super pumped about this, uh, this assignment. and. Um, his research was something like he was searching the Milky Way for the fossil remnants of other galaxies that the Milky Way had eaten long ago. And the way he was doing that was with um, a statistical survey that had been, it was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, it had been going on for a while at that point, it's still going on, um, that had some extreme statistical power. And he, he emphasized a lot that like, the reason we were able to do this is that we have this awesome survey and we did these statistical things to it. And otherwise we would never have been able to find the evidence of these stars that are traveling together and um, all related to each other because they used to be their own galaxy. You can kind of see in this picture here, this is from the Gaia telescope, which is more recent, but there are two little satellite galaxies down there below the plane of the Milky Way. Those are the large and small Magellanic clouds. Um, and those are still, they're, they're their own galaxies, the dwarf galaxies, and they are orbiting the Milky Way and the Milky Way has not eaten them yet. Um, anyway, I wrote up my assignment and this was the only assignment my uh, instructor had me completely redo. This is my homework, I still have it. <laughs> it's got, mercifully he did not use red ink, but there's a lot of edits there. Um, he basically told me I missed the point that the statistical stuff is not what readers are going to care about. Readers don't know what it means to, like it doesn't, that's not the exciting thing. There was all this like cool, visceral, violent stuff happening with the Milky Way actually cannibalizing other galaxies. That's what the story is. Um, so I'm gonna intersperse some tips for scientists talking to science writers and to live up to the title of my talk. My first tip is remember 
that you might have a different idea of what the story is than what the journalist thinks is the story, and that's okay. It doesn't mean we're not you know, representing your work well. It doesn't mean we got it wrong. It means that we have different audiences, that you know, you're worried about what your colleagues might think, or you're trying to communicate your work to other, other scientists. And maybe what's important is the statistical method that they'll be able to use with other other studies and like it's going to be important for the field that we created this new thing that like is going to be useful but that's not what non-scientists care about and that's fine that's totally fine all right so after santa cruz i did a few internships at wired and new scientists and science news um and then after that i had staff jobs at wired new scientists and science news and I'm at Science News still. Um, so my, my orbit became a little bit more constrained after that gravity assist. But um, yeah, so now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I do what I do. So I'm gonna tell you about a story I wrote last September and how it went from an idea to this headline, phosphine gas in Venus's atmosphere may be a possible sign of life. Um, some of you might remember when the story came out, it, made a pretty big splash, it was pretty cool. And so here's my perspective on, on how I found out about this in the first place and how I turned it into a story. Um, first thing we need to consider when deciding to write about something is what is news? Uh, what makes something newsworthy? How do we pick which results to write about? So some of the questions I ask myself when I'm considering this are, is it new? Is it something that just happened? Um, for regular news, this is pretty obvious, like there was an election or there was an insurrection or um, somebody gave a speech, like something happened in the world and it matters to you for some reason. Um, in, on, on the, you know, when you write about space, it might be that something is arriving at Mars, that the Perseverance rover, which is gonna land on February 18th, landed on Mars, that is a real thing that concretely happened, or that the, there are other, two other Mars missions arriving even before that, the Chinese mission Tianlin-1 and the United Arab Emirates mission called HOPE are gonna arrive on the 8th and the 9th or the 9th and the 10th. Um, so those are real things, those are news events. But often um, when there's like a new result, that means that the research was done sometime in the past, maybe the observations were taken years ago, and then the scientists had to analyze their data. They had, to, they had to calibrate all the pictures of dirt. They had to figure out what their research was telling them. And then they had to write it up and publish it in a scientific journal, which is different from a scientific, like a science magazine. The journals are for communicating between different, you know, from one scientist to another or to the scientific community, not to the general public. So, and then once you've submitted the paper to a journal, the journal sends it to other scientists to peer review it. So to read it and say, I think this is worth publishing or not, or maybe I think that they should have done this other experiment, or maybe they should analyze the data in this other way. Have they thought about this other thing? Have they cited my paper? Um, and so it can go back and forth. It can take months to go through the, the publishing process to get your paper in a journal. So the thing that is news for me is this paper was published, but actually what I'm presenting is like, there was a piece of research that was done a while ago that is now coming to you. So I, I sometimes get up in my head a little bit about like what is news, but the, the news event can be, there's a journal paper or someone gave a talk at a conference or something like that. Um, so once I've got the paper, is this a first? Is it the first time that this thing has happened? Is it the first time we have seen an exoplanet the same size as Earth? Or another good example is the, um, there was a picture of a black hole in M87 that the very first picture taken of a black hole, this was presented in 2019. So that was a good one, but that was definitely a first, the first time that that had happened. And that means it's news. Um, is it timely? So after that black hole, I mean, black holes are always, popular, everyone loves black holes, but when it was in the zeitgeist, after the um, the first image was published, then any story about that particular black hole became, you know, it just kind of raised uh, in importance a little bit for a while. Is it an est? Another thing that might be, um, you know, apart from first, is it a superlative in some other way? Is it the farthest, biggest, smallest, most massive, coldest, whatever? 
Um, and then is it surprising? Does it challenge or break or overturn something that we expected or something that we thought was true? Um, the sort of almost a joke uh, example of this that they teach us in journalism school is dog bites man, not a news story. That's not surprising. Man bites dog, that might be a story. So the first time I heard about this Venus thing was it was this email. I'm sorry for all the text, you can ignore it. But I, um, this email was from the Nature Astronomy uh, press pack. So I get an email every week that tells me what some of the highlighted, most potentially interesting papers that are gonna be in this journal Nature and Science does this also. And they do this because these, these are some of the biggest, flashiest, like Vogue and Vanity Fair kind of journals. Um, and they want to be the first to publish the stuff that they are publishing. So they have an agreement called an embargo system with journalists where they will send us the papers before they're published, as long as we agree not to publish our stories until the appointed time, until they can publish their actual paper first. So if you've ever noticed that um, on Wednesday and Thursday afternoons, lots and lots of news outlets have the same story, that's why. It's because we all got them early and we are waiting for the embargo to lift um, to publish our, our stuff. And this can be a tricky thing for the scientists who are trying to publish their papers because it has happened that um, if a publication breaks the embargo, if we publish too early, first, the journal will take away our, our early access privileges, which is a pain, but it can also hurt the scientists. It can, um, they can decide that this has been already out there. It's been published already. They're not the first, and then they won't publish it. Um, having a paper published in these journals is a really big deal for a scientist's career. So. I think it's understandable that scientists are nervous about this. Um, and this comes up most often, I think, the most times that I've seen this come up is when someone presented their work at a conference and it's maybe a little bit preliminary and the paper is not done yet, but they want to submit someplace like Science or Nature, or they have already submitted it to Science and Nature, it just hasn't been published before the conference happens. Um, and I want to write about it because I'm at the conference and you just presented it in public. So it's out there um, and it's, you know, worthy of being published in these big journals. So it's probably pretty cool. But the scientist doesn't want to talk to me and they don't want me to write a story at all because they're worried about jeopardizing the chances of their, um, their paper being actually accepted into the journal. And so I just want to reassure you about that, that the um, the rules from nature and science at least are that I am allowed to write the story as long as I only quote from the public talk. And you are allowed to explain stuff to me as long as I don't quote you. So you can clarify things and you just can't give me an interview. You can't be seen as seeking press attention, but press attention can happen to you. So my next tip, don't fear the embargo. Um, talk to us about it, make sure we understand it, make sure you understand it, but don't be, scared off from talking to us at all or having any uh, press uh, attention to your work just because of the embargo system. So, okay, so I got this email from Nature Astronomy. Honestly, this write-up didn't particularly grab me. Um, it looked like it was just some weird atmospheric chemistry in the clouds of Venus uh, could host unknown photochemical or geochemical processes. Okay. Um, on Earth, phosphine is a gas produced pre predominantly by anaerobic biological sources. That doesn't really scream anything to me. I thought it maybe, maybe I would give this one a pass. Um, but then I got this press release from the MIT news office. And a press release is different from a, a reported news article in that it's supposed to be promoting the work of the, um, the institution and of the people who work for it and of their funders. So they, they do often do excellent, excellent work in, in translating science and, and, and communicating science and the research for, you know, in presenting in an engaging and accessible way for people who aren't scientists. Um, they're just taking a different uh, slant on it. It's, it's PR. Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know if you can hear the beeping behind me, but I don't know what that is. No, good, great. Um, okay, so this, Press, press release made me think maybe I'm going to have to write about this because this, um, the headline they put on this, astronomers may have found the signature of life on Venus, 
I knew it was going to be taken like that. Um, it's aliens. People love alien. I love aliens. Aliens is what got me into this in the first place. But anything that says aliens or might say aliens tends to get outsized attention. Um, and science news, uh, we have a reputation for being like the well actually squad. And since I had looked at the paper originally and thought this doesn't look like it's really that huge of a claim, um, I wanted to have our version out there saying, uh, well, actually, maybe here, here are all the caveats, right? I wanted an appropriately caveated story that was excited about maybe it's aliens, but maybe it's probably not aliens. I don't know. Um, I read the paper and this is, if I were giving this talk to an audience of hopeful science journalists, I would really emphasize this. You always have to read the paper. You cannot claim that you know what you're talking about if you haven't read the paper. Um, and so we get the papers early and the paper also said that, okay, analogy with biological production of phosphine on earth from the presence of life. All right, so that's why this is interesting. Maybe phosphine is related to life. But they also said, it is not robust evidence for life, only for anomalous and unexplained chemistry. So I sent my email. This is, some of the stuff is, is um, specific to how we do things at Science News. It's not how all science publications do things, but Science News, I sent an email to my editor pitching the story saying, here's what I think we should write. Um, you can tell from my subject line how skeptical it was. Here's what we, here's what we should say, probably not aliens, but everyone's gonna say aliens. Um, my editor agreed, she liked this, the pitch and she gave me uh, a deadline and assigned the story. So, okay, I have a story assignment and I've read the paper. Here's where I want to talk to you, the scientist. Um, let me take a sec. So usually I try to talk to, at very least, the first author of the paper. In this case, this was Jane Greaves. She's an astronomer at Cardiff University in Wales. And if I can, if I have time, I try to talk to someone else as well. Cause sometimes the first author um, was just the, like the head of the lab and didn't do the actual hands-on work or maybe did some of the work, but not other aspects of it. So in this case, I also talked to Clara Sousa Silva, who's a um, cosmochemist at, um, or an astrochemist. She calls herself an astrochemist at MIT. And she was the one that the MIT press release was, uh, was mostly promoting. And what I knew going in, my, my own background knowledge about Venus was that Venus is a nightmare land. It is the same size and mass as Earth, but it is hot enough to melt lead at the surface. The atmospheric pressure is crushing. It rains sulfuric acid and it eats spacecraft, basically. This picture was taken by the Soviet Venera 13 spacecraft in 1982. Um, and it and every other spacecraft that has ever made it to the surface of Venus has died within two hours of landing. And the um, Soviet space flight control director at the time said, if you wanted spinners to fry in their own juices, Venus would be the place to send them, which is delightfully gruesome. Um, however, there's growing evidence and, and a growing sense among some planetary scientists that Venus might have been a better place to hang out once. It might have had liquid water ocean. Um, it might have been habitable. And there are regions in the Venus the, the, the Venusian atmosphere, um, where the temperatures are not that bad. So there has been serious speculation for a while about floating biospheres up in the clouds. So when I talked to Clara, she told me about phosphine. This is phosphine. It is one phosphorus atom and three hydrogen. And she said it's a really disgusting molecule. It's actually mostly poisonous. It shows up in places where there's no oxygen, like sewage and intestinal tracts. Um, it's used as a bioweapon. And it is her favorite molecule. It should be no one's favorite, but she loved it. She did her PhD thesis on it. And she had a paper in January, 2020 in astrobiology about using it as a biosignature molecule, which is, it means that that would be a sign of life. That if we could see this molecule, um, it's, a, it's a very fragile molecule and it breaks apart pretty easily, especially in the presence of sunlight. So if enough of it could accumulate in an atmosphere of a planet that we could detect it, that means something must be actively producing it. And she argued that that can only mean life. Um, so that paper got a little bit of press attention at a time in last January. Um, and this is from her website that uh, 
an article in Popular Mechanics called her work Finding Alien Farts, which is about right. So I love that she had a sense of humor about it. That is my next tip. Have a sense of humor about your own work. Um, don't be afraid to laugh about it. And you know, you're having fun, have fun with us. Um, and also use analogies. Alien farts is great. It engages multiple senses. Um, it's just really visceral and really like, maybe it's not, uh, maybe farts are methane and not phosphine, but maybe aliens fart phosphine, we don't know. Um, so if you can, and that's, that's one of the best ways to break down um, a complex subject and make it more digestible, so to speak, for, um, for people who haven't encountered this stuff before is to use an analogy to something that they might be familiar with already. So that's, that's one of the best things you can do if you're talking to a reporter is come prepared with an analogy um, and use lots of sensory language if you can. So then I talked to Jane Green and she didn't know Clara before they started working together on this, but she had come across her work. And um, what Jane was trying to work on was looking for molecules that you could see in the atmospheres of exoplanets with something like the James Webb Space Telescope, which is what this image shows. So um, when we have an exoplanet, say my hand is a star, if you have a planet that goes in front of the star, then the starlight can shine through the atmosphere of the planet. And we can see in that starlight, the molecular fingerprint of anything interesting or maybe not interesting of, of certain molecules that could build up in the atmosphere to a level where we could see them. And that's what James Webb is going to be really, really good at doing. And hopefully this telescope will launch in October of this year and we'll start doing that. So uh, Jane Greaves wanted to see if phosphine would even be detectable to something like James Webb. So she decided it was worth checking Venus because it probably isn't there. <laughs> um, she used the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii to try to set a baseline for what, um, what James Webb might see if there was no Venus, no phosphine in the planetary atmosphere. She really didn't expect to see it. Um, so when she did find it at Venus, she took a first look and she saw it and she was shocked. She thought she had done something wrong. She reanalyzed the, the data over and over um, and just didn't totally believe it herself. Um, which brings me to my next tip. Tell your own research. Tell your own story like you're the main character. I, I really enjoyed talking to Jane because she set everything up like that with she didn't know Clara first and here's what she did and and what she thought and what you know here's what she actually did with her hands and with her brain and what she thought and what she felt when she did it. Um, you know, present yourself like a person. So disbelieving their own results, um, Jane teamed up with Clara. They used the Alma telescope in Chile, which is much more powerful array of telescopes and the line was still there. So they decided to publish. Um, and they were still really clear on saying it's not a sign of life. It is a sign of interesting chemistry that could be associated with life. Um, so after I spoke to both of them, I don't remember if this happened in this particular instance, but often at the end of an interview, uh, the scientists will ask me if I can send them a copy of the story before it comes out in, the, um, in my magazine, before publication. And I always have to tell them no. Um, and I do understand why, why they want me to, um, why they're interested in that. But the reason that I can't is because it's for a journalistic ethics reason. And I make an analogy to like political reporting. If I were reporting on Congress and I sent my story to Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell to have them approve it before I published it, you wouldn't trust that story. That would be, um, that's not journalism. That is something that uh, press release writers have to do. That um, if you're, you know, a public information officer, if you're doing PR for um, for an institution, you do have to send the story to the scientists and then also maybe to um, other bureaucratic people. I know NASA has several levels of people who need to approve things before they are released to the public, um, and that that's fine. But it's just different. Like you. If, if we are seen as trying to get approval from our sources before we publish things, then that means the journalism is less trustworthy. Um, and I, I feel pretty strongly about that in, in this particular, you know, the climate that we're living in now that it's important to, even, even when it's not like as high stakes as something like 
political or, or I don't know, there's no, no one's gonna start a war over phosphine on Venus, but um, I, I think it's important. So that's why I can't just let you tell us what to say. We, we are trying to understand the needs of our audience in the context of the broader scientific community and the world in general. Um, but, so that's, yeah, my next tip, you can ask us questions. We can't send you the entire story, but you can ask us questions too. And you can ask us how, we're, how we have understood what you told us and what's going to happen next. Um, I can also read back quotes. Um, so you can ask us to do that. All right, I'm gonna keep going. So the next thing I do is I speak to other people who were not involved in the research. And this is kind of like a little peer review in miniature. Um, sometimes they're really critical of the work. In this case, my, both of my outside commenters were really excited, but I'll come back to that. So this is Dr. Sanjay LeMay of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he wrote about these potential biospheres in the life of the, uh, sorry, in Venus's clouds. And this is Dr. David Grinspoon, who has been writing about the potential for life on Venus for decades. This is his book from 1997. Um, hey, <laughs> Brian has that book. <laughs> um, so they were both really excited about this paper, but even David, who like really wants to find life on Venus, said uh, he was delighted to hear about it, not because I want to declare victory and say this is definite evidence of life on Venus. It's not, but it's an intriguing signature that could be a sign of life on Venus, and it obligates us to go investigate further. So then the next thing that happens is I write up my story, I send it to my editor, she sends back more red ink. Um, so this went through two rounds of edits. You can see some of our, um, some of the headlines that we batted back and forth. I think my first one uh, was just, we should be really careful how we headline this. Um, and even with the one that we ended up with, we put possible sign of life in quotes because that was how, how Jane Greaves put it. She said, it's not life, it's a possible sign of life. And we were like, we will let you say that. It's not us saying it. Um, here's some more edits just to show you how much, you know, question asking and going through stuff that we did. So, all right, so how did we do? As a, you know, the science journalism community in general, we said possible sign of life. This is new scientist, life on Venus, question mark. Um, new York Times also, this is on the front page of the New York Times. They also went with life on Venus, question mark. Um, Possible sign of life in NPR. Venus might host life, said Scientific American. I think that might be the most uh, pushing it to the edge that I saw. And maybe the most restrained, um, this was National Geographic. Possible sign of life on Venus stirs up heated debate. So not saying this was a discovery, but it's a heated debate. Um, so even after everybody was like, we're not saying it's life, we're not saying it's aliens even everybody trying to be careful, we were like, but it's aliens. Um, oh, and the next thing that happens at Science News is uh, everything, we have a website and a print magazine. The print magazine comes out every other week. So after things go online, they get cut down to size so that they fit on the page and then they go in the actual print magazine. And in, as part of that process, they get thoroughly fact checked. So this is what my story looked like after the fact checker was through with it. Everything in yellow was something she could confirm independently. Everything in pink was something she wanted me to um, either back up or change. So one of these here, she just highlighted Greaves. The comment there was, was it really Greaves who looked at the planet with James Clerk Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii or was it Greaves and her colleagues? It wasn't just her. So that's, that's the level of nitpickiness that we do. It's very important and it's a pain in the butt. Um, and then here was the, the cover where again, we said life on Venus question mark. Uh, but that's not the end of the story. A few weeks later, another paper appeared that knocked the phosphine detection down. This group, which was led by Ines Snellen of the Leiden University in the Netherlands, argued that the signal wasn't there at all. It was actually a mirage created by the data processing technique that Greaves Mill used. Um, and there have been other papers since then that also found no signs of phosphine. And I feel like this comes back to my um, my choice of outside commenters. I chose to talk to people who could talk about what the result would mean for Venus, if it were true, who, who studied the potential for life on Venus and could put it put that part in context. Um, but I didn't talk to people who do the same kinds of observations and the telescopes that they use don't usually look at objects in the solar system. They usually look at um, sometimes exoplanets, sometimes really distant galaxies. 
and um, maybe people who use those same telescopes to do other kinds of things, or if there are any other people who use those telescopes to look within the solar system, there are, I found a couple of them later, um, those might have been better outside commenters to more fully vet the, um, the methods that they used, the, the way that they figured out what they thought they knew. So that's the way that I could have done better. Um, so I ended up writing another story. This time I wrote it as like a process story. This is how science works. Uh, I knew that there was going to be a flurry of papers uh, responding to this and that there would kind of be a ping pong match going back and forth until either it was confirmed or retracted. I didn't want to cover every paper in the ping pong match, so I, I kind of put a pin in it this way by um, talking about it as a, a story that shows how science works, that the, the process of science is people doing a study and then other people or the same people doing the study again and seeing if you can get the same results over and over again. Um, and that's, that's how it goes. Like sometimes you have a big flashy result and then someone else knocks it down. Um, and so this is my galaxy brain moment, but given all that potential for embarrassment, for having you know years of work knocked down in public, why should you agree to talk to reporters at all if we're just gonna be bringing more attention to this and, and maybe having this you know, embarrassing thing happen to you in public? Um, there's you know, the, the practical mercenary argument, which is that funding agencies and, and granting agencies, you like to see researchers do outreach. It can have a positive impact on your funding. Um, but I think that having science done in public is about building trust in science as a process and in how science works. Um, I think it's really, really useful to show science happening in real time in, um, in front of people. And I think this, this year especially has shown us how important that is. Astronomy can be kind of a gateway science where you know, it gets people interested in it, kids love it. Um, and it's about as apolitical and bipartisan as it gets, I think. It's not something that just Democrats or just Republicans are interested in. Um, it's not completely apolitical, certainly, but it's, uh, you know, in, it's something that a lot of different kinds of people can agree is cool. Um, and so when you, and, but astronomy can also be a gateway to conspiracy theories. It can be a gateway science and that, you know, it cuts both ways. Um, but so I, I believe that when we're honest about how the scientific process works and how sometimes when you put something out there, other people find that you were wrong and you go back and forth until you can reach consensus. When we can show that process happening for something as alien and and um, interesting as phosphine on Venus, maybe that will help people accept it at work for something like how does a virus travel? Maybe it will make it easier to accept changing guidance on things like whether or not to wear a mask or how we trust the efficacy of vaccines. And maybe it will help people apply that sort of thinking in their own lives. Um, I don't really have any evidence that it actually works this way. I might have some, this might be an unearned Pollyanna kind of perspective. Maybe it's the exact opposite. Maybe having all this, you know, flashy science and then knocking it down again, maybe that dissolves trust in science. I'm not sure, but that is part of what I'm trying to do and part of what I hope you will do with me. Um, so I'm gonna leave my my tips slide up here so you can look at it, and I am looking forward to your questions. Thanks so much. Okay, Lisa. So our uh, we usually, as I told you earlier, we usually take uh, questions over the YouTube chat feature. For some reason, it only turned on about like ten minutes ago. I don't. We've never had. Oh no! Time. It didn't actually work. Um, so I, I, it is working now. So I'm going to keep an eye on it, but nobody's posted any questions yet. Um, okay. But, but as you were going through your talk, I had I had some questions come up. Um, I'm really interested, actually, in this last comment you're making about um, trust, uh, the public's trust in science, and like, I mean, clearly, clearly, that has has been an issue in this last year. And so, what do you think? I mean, what do you think, as scientists, we can do to to improve that trust uh, from the public, um, especially in cases like this where it's so important? Yeah, I mean, that is like 
the question of our age because it's clearly not as easy as I would like it to be. I, I would like it to just be like, we just need you be honest and people will trust us, but it's, um, it's clearly not that simple. But, but that is like step one. You do need to be honest and you need to be consistent. And that's why I, I kept hammering on about the like, we can't send you the story to, um, you know, for you to make sure that we got your science right, because that's an ethical boundary. And I will make sure I get the science right, but I'm going to hold that ethical boundary too. And like, um, yeah, there are, there are other rules for journalistic ethics. You were asking about what scientists can do. This is about journalists, but um, yeah, what can scientists do to increase public trust in science? I do think that the not retreating to the ivory tower is really important, that, that presenting your work and being human. And, and when you do make mistakes and when there are things that don't, um, you know, or results that, that get knocked down when it wasn't a, an issue of like malfeasance or fraud, um, I don't know, be, be honest and kind about it and <laughs> humble. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, know, yeah. One thing I've heard uh, mentioned is um, uh, people don't understand statistics. And I feel like yeah. statistics and statistical uncertainty has played such a huge role in this COVID crisis. And, and people, to the extent that they're listening to scientists, look for this sort of like ironclad uncertainty. And I think that there's not a sense and I think on the part of educators like myself, it's a failing. We have we have spent a lot of time explaining to students how to calculate like integrals, but we don't spend very much time at all teaching them like basic statistics. And so, yeah, it feels like maybe it's yeah. it's not even at the journalist scientist level that we need to be doing this work. We really need to be like in the in the education system. The school, maybe, yeah. <laughs> no, I got all the way through a physics degree at Cornell and I didn't have to take statistics once. And that's ridiculous. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's hard. Statistical thinking is not intuitive. And even when you know the statistics, it can still be hard to fight your own biases about what is, you know, oh, it feels safe to go hang out with my friend. But yeah, it's, it's extremely hard. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's, uh, yeah. Um, let's see. I had a bunch of other questions up here. No, actually, I think there's also a sense that like, scientists are just trying to tell you what to do. And, and there's like, I think we need to respect people's intelligence too. It's not just that they don't understand statistics. It's that we need to trust them to be able to make risk assessments also, and not like come at them with like, I know the science. And so I am telling you what's best. Like there's um, some, some arguments I've seen are, about trying to be really like rigid and black and white and like this is right and this is wrong when nothing about the situation is is that straightforward. It's all very messy. Um, and that can be really difficult to do and and especially in like a, you know, whatever that was, an 800 word news story, but <laughs> like um, but but trying to convey the nuance and the uncertainties is so important and so difficult. Okay, what was your other question? Yeah, I have some questions from the students that I don't think we had a chance to get to earlier this afternoon. Somebody asked, oh, this is great. What is what is your favorite article that you've written? That's hard. I saw that one. Um, I have lots of favorites. I don't know. Um, recently, I wrote about um, last winter, the star Betelgeuse, which is the brightest or one of the brightest stars in uh, the constellation Orion started dimming. And scientists know that Betelgeuse is the kind of star that is going to go supernova sometime soon, but sometime soon could be like 200,000 years from now, um, or it could be tomorrow, we don't know. And so there was all this excitement about maybe Betelgeuse is going to explode and then it didn't, um, but the rush to observe it while we thought maybe something was gonna happen uh, led to all this, like we have all this new information about Betelgeuse and, and so what was it doing instead of exploding last year? Um, so that story came out last November. That one was really fun. I don't know if it's my favorite ever. What was my favorite ever? Gosh, I'll come back to that. <laughs> um, and I, I have to ask this because you flashed the, the flash the right right up uh, on, the, on the screen so quickly. Um, the story that you showed us at the beginning that you wrote 
uh, for your for your class. Yeah, do you want me to go back to that? <laughs> is, was it Kevin Schlaufman who was the first? It was, it was, yeah. All right, I thought I saw that name, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think he's at Johns Hopkins now. Yeah, that's right, he is, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, that's fun. Um, yeah, so what do you think about this uh, Venusian phosphine situation? Have you been following it more recently? Have you seen any of the more recent studies? Yeah. Um, yep, there's been some more. Uh, there's one study that said it was, it looked like it was consistent with sulfurous gas. I forget which one, but um, the same the same spectral feature might have just been sulfur. Um, that seems plausible. And I think there was some stuff about the the data from Alma that they used had to be recalibrated anyway, and they haven't finished doing that. And they haven't re-released um, the results. But if you look at the Nature paper now, there's a there's a um, a note on it that says this might be in the process of being looked at again. So I think this might be one that doesn't last. Um, but it got people talking about Venus and maybe I, I would love to see a spacecraft go to Venus. I've been hammering on this for a couple of years too, that Venus is extremely cool. And people have been working on ways to get spacecraft to survive on Venus for longer than two hours for a while now. And those ideas are really, really clever and fun. Um, so I would love to write about a Venus mission. I want somebody to send something there. Um, uh, but maybe we don't have to go to look for phosphine. Maybe that's not the motivation to get there. Well, and it's funny. I think um, that um, just before this phosphine detection was made, um, NASA had selected two um, Venus missions uh, in the Discovery Panel for follow-up mm -hmm. studies. Um, so I suspect that as soon as this phosphine story came out, those two mission people, those two mission groups, were immediately pushing <laughs> for like, it. Like, all oh, right. <laughs> Yeah. They're not designed. They're not designed to study the atmosphere, particularly. They're designed to study the surface. But no, yeah. I'm sure that was interest. That was very interesting to them. Right, so, where they've uh, been. Yeah. Go sorry, ahead. Go ahead. Oh, please. Oh, please. I was. Um, if, if maybe the people on those missions were like, "Can we squeeze on an atmosphere instrument at the last second, maybe?" But I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that was a reaction. Have you Have you talked to Greaves after all of this? Have you Had you caught up with her and seen what her thoughts are on on this these recent? Um, I caught up with her for my follow-up story a couple weeks after with the Snellen paper. Um, and she basically thinks that they were not uh, commenting publicly at that time, but she told me that they they were fixing whatever the issue was in the Alma pipeline. Um, and they were, she'll be back in touch again when they've done that. So that's what I'm what I'm waiting for from Greece. But, um, but I, I think I quoted Clara Sousa Silva again in that follow-up story and she basically said this is how science works this is what's supposed to happen uh, and they, they kind of had a bit of an attitude of like we didn't believe this when we saw it and we couldn't come up with any other explanation so here you are we're all to come up with another explanation and then people are so like if no one else could have come up with another explanation then great then maybe you have a Sherlock Holmes you know whatever is left after you've eliminated the improbable however impossible must be the truth but but there are other other possibilities here that um seem to be holding up so um and what do you think about uh the pressure on scientists to publish flashy results like this because i feel like when you when you showed the last paragraph of their article they were very conservative and reasonable yeah. about the explanation but but even like the the way that nature sold the result i mean it uh, it seemed, I don't know, it, it just seemed a lot stronger than what they were claiming. Um, I agree. Uh, uh, yeah, kind of, there are a couple of, of walls I would like to be a fly on um, to <laughs> to find out how that happened between the paper and the press release and the, um, yeah, is it, who, yeah, is there, do you feel like there's pressure on scientists to present your results in a more flashy way than you want to in or is it as, as soon as it gets to people like us that it gets blown up? Well, I, you know, there's always this pressure for science funding. Sure. And, you know, I don't, I've never had a conversation with a NASA program officer and, you know, somebody who runs one of these grant programs and said, do you care whether we get news articles out of their, our research? But they do ask you to tell them if you find get some, some sort of newsy result. Um, 
So I, I mean, I, it's hard to, it's hard to think that there's not some, some pressure to kind of come up with these flashy results. And, and I do think that that, I don't think in this case it was oversold um, by the scientists themselves, but I do feel like in some cases scientists will oversell their work. Um, um, yeah, for for funding, for for acclaim, you know, for all kinds of reasons. Um, yeah, the limited funding situation does not <laughs> does not help things. Yeah, and there's a lot of competition. Yeah. Um, let's see. I have one question here. I'm trying to understand what it's saying. Uh, what was the quote that you mentioned about VS ad avdu? Oh yeah, the um, this was the v yeah. So VS I... Abduski, and what book or article did he do, did he mention? Oh yeah. So this this was the um, deputy director of the Soviet Union Space Flight Control Center. This is from a 1976 issue of Science News about um, the Venera 9 and 10 uh, landing. So this was uh, something that this guy said, he was a Russian guy um, at a press conference after those missions sent back their first images of the surface of Venus. And we realized what a terrible place it was. So, so it was a, a science news article from 76 is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where that quote's from, yeah. Okay, hopefully, yeah, it looks like, uh, okay, yeah. Right there. I, will say, I, I will say that when I was a kid, Venus was my favorite planet because I loved the idea that it was basically like this hell planet, that there was like volcanoes and acid rain, you know, sulfuric acid clouds. Yeah. And I mean, it was always my favorite planet when I was Pretty a kid. Pretty metal, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it still your favorite planet? Um. Uh, in the solar system, I have to say Titan is now kind of my my favorite. Um, I know it technically it's not a planet, but you've talked to a lot of planetary scientists. Most planetary scientists are are very um, uh, relaxed about using that word. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's not because Venus is not still very cool. And in fact, as you see, I'm I'm reading Grinspoon's book now, so um, I'm getting I'm getting excited now about these these upcoming missions. So uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll go back to my my eight year old uh, <laughs> my eight year old preferences. Right. Um, okay, but Titan great. is getting a spacecraft soon. And Titan is going to get a spacecraft. Soon. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. The Dragonfly mission, I'm really excited about. So I have a lot of friends involved with that. So it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be. And we there's an Idaho connection, of course. Jason Barnes, who's the deputy uh, oh, yeah. principal, in, uh, deputy principal uh, project scientist is at, at University of Idaho. So and we've had him speak at this, at this awesome. um, series before. So. Well, that was great. I really appreciate you taking the time, Lisa. I know that it's late where you are, so <laughs> we really appreciate okay. it. And you have a bunch of people, a bunch of fans on YouTube watching, so I promise you do have a crowd, I mean, even though this doesn't look like it, so. Thanks for coming, everybody. It was great talking with you. Great. And yeah, and, thanks so much, Brian. Yeah, for sure. And folks, if you um, uh, want to join us again, uh, March 5th is our next First Friday. We will have our virtual planetarium show on the third Thursday uh, going forward. That will be February 18th, and we'll talk about Mars 2020. Have a good weekend, everybody. Stay safe. Wear